honored to be here. I feel very, in, uh, after trying to follow Dan, you know, that's, that's not a very good thing to have to do. But at least I'm not going to have to follow Frank Bigger. So. <laughs> uh, the Foster family uh, arrived here in the 1820s. But uh, my lineage, I could talk about a lot of, of people. Uh, I'm a direct descendant of William Looney, William Stubblefield, John Wells, uh, of course, the Fosters, the Myricks. Uh, these people all settled in Randolph County uh, coming out of mid-Tennessee in the early 1800s through uh, the 1820s and 30s. But going up, along with the theme of, of, of this, of great women of Randolph County, I'm going to primarily talk about the women in my family. Uh, you know, they say, the old saying is, that behind every good man is a good lady. Well, I think we all agree to that. <clears throat> and my dad always said, he said, son, said, you know, every man is entitled to one good bird dog and one good wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had two good bird dogs. Oh. One of them was out of uh, Wahoo Pete, and one of them was uh, out of Reagan's White Night. So any of you bird hunters might know what the lineage of those dogs were. Well, I also I had uh, one good wife for 64 years. And uh, after a lot of thought and due consideration, I think I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start out with Lida Briley Foster, born in 1792 in North Carolina. Uh, she married uh, Thomas. Foster, and Thomas was uh, a foster breed. He was never really settled. He loved to move around. Uh, so in about 1820, he and the Drapers and the Manskers decided they would come to uh, go to Texas. Well, uh, Tom approached Lida about coming to Texas, going to Texas. And she said, now, Jake, or Tom, I'll go, but this is the last move I'm going to make. We moved from North Carolina. We moved in three or four different counties in Tennessee, and I'm tired. And we've got a family started, and, and this is it. He said, well, all right. So they took off. Well, <coughs> Tom was not a uh, row crop farmer. He was a cattleman. So they sold their holdings there. And they didn't come in here on uh, in covered wagons. They come in by pack mules and horses. <coughs> they rode and drove their cattle through and uh, had their belongings on pack horses. Well, when they arrived in uh, Randolph County, uh, they had had a hard travel and the cattle were in uh, pretty bad shape, so they decided they would winter here. So they camped up about where is Martin Springs right now. And uh, they spent the winter. 
Well, the Manskers found some property that they liked on a nice creek, nice creek bottom, so they just uh, decided they was going to settle, and they bought a nice place and, and set up uh, a place to live. Well, come spring, and the cattle were doing well, and Tom said, well, it's time to head for Texas. And Lida said, no, it's not. My sister's here. She had married uh, James Manster. And we've got other people that we know here, and this is where I'm staying. Now, if you want to go to Texas, you take off, but I'm staying here. So that settled that. Uh, time went on, and uh, Tom bought uh, 80 acres from Jabadiah Davis over at M. Bowden. And that is what is now Martin Springs. Well, they settled and built a nice little cabin there and <laughs> set up and had uh, pasture for their cattle and were living pretty good uh, <laughs> at those times. Well, as time uh, rocked on, uh, <laughs> Tom got the restless again. So one morning he got up, got on his horse, and rode off, and no one's heard from him since. Uh, the rumor was that uh, he either went to Texas or had another lady friend somewhere else. They never did find out. Uh, but uh, it was 1937, and... Uh, that was when the Texas was getting ready to... 18, 18. Huh? You said 19. Oh, 18, I'm sorry. <laughs> 1837. Just a little hundred years off there. Uh, 1837, of course, was when Texas was getting ready to uh, fight. So, uh, we don't know. But anyhow, that left Lida with uh, three boys and uh, five girls. The youngest one was my great-grandfather, who was about uh, six years old. Well, he was seven. He was born in 30, 1830. This is 1837. Uh, they were left there to fend for themselves. The oldest one, which was born in uh, 1811, had already he married and uh, was settled, so that left her with the, uh, the younger ones to fend for and try to make a living. Well, in the latter part of 37, the older boy was in a wagon and the team ran over, uh, ran off, and it wrecked, and he was killed. Well, that left uh, her pretty well to fend for herself, and uh, the two boys she had left was Tom and, and uh, Jake. Of course, Jake was too uh, young to do much, but uh, Tom was up in his teens, and they worked. But times were hard. Uh, so they almost starved out, but uh, the 80 acres, uh, uh, Lida went to uh, James uh, Martin, and uh, he had moved in and was starting his plantation, which probably, and if I'm not right, was probably the largest plantation in Randolph County in its day, was it not? Well, I, I like to think it was. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll, give, we'll grant it that it was. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, he gave her uh, $350 for the 80 acres, which was 
not a bad deal. So time uh, Ann said that they could live in the cabin as long as she wanted to. Well, that cemented a very close relation between the Fosters and the man and the Martins uh, over the years. Well, in the meantime, uh, Lida's father had uh, left Tennessee with the other part of the family and gone to Mississippi. He had uh, built quite a plantation in Mississippi. So in that year of 37, he passed away. But uh, uh, the estate was not settled for two or three years. But in a couple of three years, she got a letter that she had inherited $2,600. Now, with land at uh, $2 an acre, and things so cheap, that was a fortune. And Tom sat down and he had gone to the uh, post office, or to the courthouse, and found where a fellow had uh, uh, sold some cattle for $70 and some hogs and stuff. And so he. Uh, I uh, went uh, to work to uh, figure out by multiplying what that $2,600 would buy. Well, according to the thing, at the, if you multiplied, you could buy 23 horses, 9 to 10 years old, 32 cows, 8 years old, with calves, 32 steers, each 2 years old. 131 yearlings, half steers and half heifers, 1,314 hogs, each one year old, and 328 breeding sows. That was a fortune. Well, uh, she told Tom, and she was a very strong-willed woman, and was a good provider, I mean a good business person. So they started uh, and formed a company between she and Jake and, and Tom. All three were involved in the loan to all three of them. So uh, they started buying land and developing uh, uh, cattle and Hogs and, and what have you, and had accumulated up to 2,000, as I said, 2,000 acres of uh, land between what is uh, on the old military road there from Attica uh, to Maynard. And along over the years, uh, Jake, my great grandfather, had 13 children. A lot of them passed away early on in the early years. Uh, but along that road, even in my day, I can remember, as I said, I, loved, I used to love to bird hunt. And my dad and I could start out there in the old home place, right up on the river there, Fosha River. Uh, and we could walk all the way to Maynard and probably never get off of some of the foster land and uh, bird hunting and, and uh, the life was that if you love that that was good good area so that is the remembrance that that I had uh, you know along with with this this program the other night when I was listening to Ann, you know, getting old doesn't make you smart, and getting old doesn't make you a good person, but it leaves you, leaves you with a lot of experiences and a lot of memories that the generation behind you does not have the opportunity of knowing. 
And when I was listening to Ann the other night, one of the things that I remember was uh, our old home place was up on the old military road there, and right about uh, half a mile up from the river. And it was a huge log house, nothing like the Martin plantation home, but it was a huge log house. A dog trot had three rooms on each side and had uh, a loft where all of the kids' bedrooms were. And it had two big fireplaces, double fireplaces. And when I was a young person, my, one of my uncles lived there, or the uncle, and they always had two or three, four acres of cotton, and that was their cash crop. And in the fall of the year, when the cotton was all out, then they'd go in and snap the bowls, and they would leave them in the pick sacks and stack the pick sacks on the front porch. And then at night, they'd take the sacks inside and they'd take the cotton out and throw the holes over in the fireplace and they like firecrackers. And, you know, it was a good time. I know we had a, a, a roasting pan or a, that we roasted peanuts in. And we had one that we popped popcorn in. And we'd sit there and uh, pop popcorn and uh, roast peanuts and tell stories. You know, we didn't have any television. We didn't have any radio. We got one paper once a week on the mail hive. But that was about the only communications we had. But storytelling was an art. And, and you did a marvelous job in <laughs> I certainly enjoyed it. But anyhow, getting back to, uh, to my uh, <clears throat> item. Uh, Lida stayed on and uh, coaxed her boys to do well. Uh, Tom served in the legislature uh, one term during the Civil War. Jake, the only job he ever had in politics, he was coroner one, <laughs> one year or one uh, well, time moved on, and as I say, uh, Jake finally uh, went into the ginning business, and he built a one-stand horsepower cotton gin, and uh, it was also he had a press that. Uh, was powered by a mule, and uh, he got started in the in the business uh, by uh, being on the. He was just a, uh, 18, 17, 18 years old, and they had uh, sent him into town with their cotton for the the year. I think maybe four or five bale at the most, maybe three. But anyhow, he had come into town because the cotton broker was <coughs> due in on the boat, and he bought the cotton, and most of the hill farmers would bring it in <coughs> from that time. And so uh, when he got in, by Jake uh, started dickering with him on his cotton. And, uh, he, uh, he bargained real good, and this fellow became uh, uh, impressed with what Jake knew. And he argued, he said, uh, look, uh, this is not short staple, this is good staple. It's got a good pencil string. Well, look at it, class it. It's bright, got good class. I'm entitled to top dollar on it. 
cotton buyer asked him, he said, well, where in the world did you learn all that? And he said, well, he said, I found a book. He said, I started reading it. Jake had a third grade education. He could read and write and do well with it. And so the man said, uh, you know, he said, I'm getting ready to take on a different area. He said, do you think you would uh, be interested in buying cotton for us. And he said, well, what, what's the offer? And they offered him uh, pretty good money, so much avail, and that they wanted him to travel the area before the season and hit all <laughs> these hill farmers and see if they couldn't, you know, get more business back from the local <coughs> man. So, he took the job and uh, went to, uh, every year he would uh, buy the cotton and load it on the boat and head for Memphis. And uh, uh, Jake was, uh, he was pampered, he was spoiled. <laughs> he was the last one and uh, according to my grandmother and grandfather, he never grew out of it. <laughs> kind of something he liked and stayed with it. <laughs> so, uh, he, uh, he loved to drink and he loved to gamble and uh, he liked the good life. So, the way the story goes that he was with his cotton down there, and he had gone and talked to Judge Martin before he went, and, and told him, said, now, Judge, you're going to be handling a lot of money <coughs> for uh, other people. And evidently, the judge knew Jake pretty well. And he said, I'm going to give you some advice. Said, now, uh, when you sell this cotton because you're going to have to get the money there and bring it back and pay the people here. And said, I'm going to suggest that uh, the minute you get on that boat, you give all your money to the captain to lock up. Well, uh, Jake went to Memphis and uh, he did hit the good life and he got into a, a poker game. Well, fortunately, he had left his money locked up except his own personal money and uh, had left it locked up at the uh, hotel. The fellow he was working for and so, uh, suggested he do that. Well, he had a good winning streak and According to the story, of course, I say that half of this is true and half of it's uh, uh, lies, and the other half we don't know. Uh, but anyhow, supposedly he hit it on big time, and uh, the fella he was playing with was a, a young man from Mississippi who had brought his family's cotton and he, he took his money and he didn't have anything left and still wanted to play and so he said, that, uh, uh, I've got a slave I'll put up. So he said, well, I don't know about that. Finally agreed, he won the slave. <laughs> so here he come, he won quite a bit of money and had a slave. And so he, uh, uh, started back to Arkansas on the boat. And that time they went, left Memphis, went down to where the, uh, uh, river goes into Mississippi and then comes back up and then hits Foshi and comes back up. And so, uh, Immediately after dinner the first evening, a couple of fellows 
at the bar, ask him if he'd like to play a little poker, and he said yes, he would like to play a little poker. Well, they took him. And fortunately, he had <coughs> left his company money with the captain, but his private money and what he'd won uh, was gone. Well, the next morning, when Jake went down to where the slave was, and he told him, he said, well, he said, you know, here I sit, broke, got a slave and don't know what to do with it. And he said, well, boss, he said, that's all right. I've been a slave all my life. I'll tell you what to do. That was a slave. <laughs> Well, they became, uh, uh, he stayed with Jake the rest of his life, or the rest of Jake's, uh, because the war was over. But anyhow, well, uh, 1950, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> 1850, Jake had been courting a beautiful young, young lady uh, by the name of Jane Bigger, and uh, they got married. Well, really, it was the love of his life, and they had good, good times and were very, very fortunate. Well, that's when uh, Jake built the big house up on the road, and his mother moved in with him, and Tom had gotten married, and uh, he built the log house where Judge Riggs is now, about the same time, where that house is there at the Attica, above Attica there, and which I guess is one of the third oldest houses left in Randolph County. And uh, so uh, Lida moved in with Jake and, and Jane. Well, Jane was one of the strong-willed, Bigger's lineage individuals. And they, they met uh, very well in their relationship. Well, it came along until the Civil War, and uh, Jake uh, joined the 25th Arkansas Infantry, and he had a young man that uh, worked for him. Jake was one of these that always had people working for him. and. They were well off enough that uh, Jane always had housework. She had somebody working for them. And uh, uh, she was a great lady and a pampered lady, too, because Jane made sure that she had what she wanted. <coughs> but anyhow, the, the war went along, and uh, the 25th, uh, fought all through the, the war real, real uh, bad. Uh, they had uh, been at Shiloh. They had been all across uh, over in uh, the uh, Tennessee area and had uh, been in many battles. I have a letter that uh, Jake wrote to Jane while he was camped in uh, your little rock. And in this letter, it's, it's so interesting that he tells her, he says, now, Jane, he says, take care of what you have because yeah, things are bad and, and we may never have things again. <coughs> and he goes on, he says, so go get uh, some leather and have shoes made for the kids. Uh, have uh, Tom to sow some wheat, 
And uh, just, it was a, a letter of actual how to survive uh, during the, the war. One of the stories about Lida uh, was that, of course, in, we all know that Pocahontas in this area was overland by uh, one month the Confederate and the next month it was uh, the Union uh, uh, Army. And one group rode, rode up on the Foster Place and uh, had taken quite a bit of stuff. And finally they went to the smokehouse and was going to take everything in there and she stood in the door with a chopping axe and said, you take my hams or my uh, side meat and you're going to take me. And she backed them down with an axe. Now that again uh, has been told many times but it sounds like this would have happened. Well, anyhow, it came to the uh, on to the war, and Jake uh, uh, went on, and at the the uh, South was trying to retake uh, uh, part of Mississippi down at uh, at uh, oh, well, anyhow one of the battles that was south of, of uh, <coughs> Tupelo. <coughs> and uh, the 25th was in the, fit, uh, in the real thick of it. Uh, Jake had, as I mentioned, had a young man that insisted going with him that worked for him. And uh, they were getting ready to attack and Jake sent a uh, a group down to take out the fence. There was a real fence that <coughs> they were going to have to charge through. And uh, so he uh, sent a group down to tear this fence out so when they charged it wouldn't stop them. And there was a sniper that got this young man. Uh, and uh, Jake had to see his body brought back and it was the kid that had worked for him and insisted. <coughs> he always told the story many times. And, uh, but uh, the, uh, the battle went on, and uh, Jake was hit. Oh, thank you. spill on you. Just water. No whiskey. Water. Water. <laughs> Jim's really good. Uh, Jake was hit and uh, cut off his uh, pistol belt. That's probably what saved him, but it still left a pretty good size hole in his jaw. Uh, they said that the uh, when they attacked, that the uh, uh, artillery was just horrendous and they went right into it. Most of the 25th was <coughs> destroyed there and uh, they uh, took the 25th and, and mustered it into the 30th. Made, uh, they had lost a lot too so they took the two uh, and made it into one. Well, uh, Jake had impressed uh, General Pillow and <coughs> he had called him in to come back because he was still recouping from his wound to come back to uh, Arkansas and raise another company. Well, uh, when he uh, started back at uh, Memphis, he ran on to uh, Missouri Cavalry, uh, and they crossed the river together, and they came on to Pocahontas. Well, when he got back to Pocahontas, everybody was gone. All the young people was gone. Well, Jake had been a captain in the uh, 25th. 
but he joined Reeves's regiment as a private. And uh, they were a group that worked the border country. <coughs> and uh, they, they would uh, hit and run type of operation. Well, in September of, of 84, they were uh, up in Missouri, and Jake was captured and taken to St. Louis, uh, Louis, put in prison. <coughs> and uh, uh, the early part of December, Jake escaped. got back with the regiment, but on December the 25th, he was captured again and taken back. Well, Jane, his loving wife, heard about him being in prison in St. Louis. So Jane decides to go see if she can see him, so she takes off from Pocahontas <coughs> to St. Louis. And some says she took a hack, some says she rolled <coughs> but anyhow. She got to St. Louis and tried to see him, but they wouldn't let her see him. She uh, uh, met up with some uh, uh, Ladies, uh, that uh, were spies, and uh, I have one document here of uh, out of Washington D.C. where um, uh, she and these uh, five ladies had just left Richmond and had gone through the lines and they were under suspicion. Well, uh, then the next thing was uh, she got back to St. Louis evidently and uh, started back to Pocahontas well, when she got down to Pilot Mob, they had waited for her and <coughs> captured her and found some uh, deeds and uh, land transactions. So they uh, held her for suspicion. Well, here under this document, uh, after a thorough inspection, they found some uh, documents and her panty looms. <laughs> <laughs> and he said that uh, this officer uh, said that that uh, was, in, uh, was enough uh, to hold her for a spy. So she was transferred to uh, St. Louis women's prison and died there. Uh, we don't know how Jane died, whether she was executed, <coughs> took a disease, murdered or what, but anyhow she passed away in 19, uh, 
60-something, my dad found her grave in uh, Jefferson Barracks Cemetery uh, near St. Louis. So that ended that uh, phase of her life. And uh, Jake came back to Arkansas after the war. And there's quite a history on his returning of he and three other Randolph Countyans, uh, how they walked back from, uh, they'd been transferred up into Illinois, and how they uh, made their way back to Randolph County. Uh, <coughs> Thea Biggers, Jane's young, sis uh, young sister, who was 18 years older than uh, younger than my, than Jake, had, uh, when uh, Jane left, had moved in with Lida to help her with the children and everything while Jane was gone, which never came back. Well, when Jake came back to Randolph County and uh, all, he married Jane. Uh, I mean, uh, Thea. Uh, Jane's sister, and they had seven children, and all grew up here in Randolph County. Uh, they uh, did well, but nothing like before the war. They they had lived well, but nothing compared to the thing because uh, when the Troops had come into Randolph County. They burned it again down, and he rebuilt it. But it was burned the second time. Uh, he could not get any. He was a, a so a ex soldier and could not vote. Could not had no rights. They had not passed the law that gave them. Uh, the rights of, of a citizenship. They were non-citizens actually for uh, several years after the war. Uh, Jake went on here and uh, lived uh, until uh, 1911. Uh, Thea, uh, Thea died in 1848, uh, 18, 1868, and uh, my grandfather <coughs> was uh, three years old. And Jake again, uh, then married uh, Conway uh, Jarrett's widow. That was senior, Conway Senior. He had been shot by either, it was either his uh, son in law or brother in law. Uh, and his son in law. Huh? His son in law. His son in law. Yeah. And uh, he was never uh, tried. And Jake married uh, his widow, and that's where the Fosters and the Jarrods became. Uh, there was a, a, a town or a, a village that was named Foster, and it had a post office, and uh, I guess a uh, blacksmith and a, and a general store was about all they had there. It was, uh, the post office was uh, an operative up until 1914. <coughs> At that time it was transferred over to Attica. But that uh, dissolved that town. Uh, Jake uh, as I say, passed on in uh, 
1911, and uh, left quite a heritage. His brother Tom was probably uh, the best of the Forrester families. Uh, he was a good Christian man and a, and a very devout man, a man of very few words and completely different from Jake, but uh, uh, he was very strong in his beliefs and, and his uh, integrity, and uh, uh, Jake could kind of, if you shook hands with him, you'd kind of want to watch your, watch or your <laughs> ring, you know, uh, and he left that legacy to some of his uh, folks, but uh, anyhow. So that pretty well takes in consideration of what the Foster family did. My, as I say, my grandfather uh, settled here and uh, uh, we all lived in the old family place at one time or the other, which is uh, not many people can say they lived in a dog trot house. But uh, that winds up the family of Fosters, and our cemetery is still uh, going strong, and we do, do have a, a place for all of us to wind up. I thank you all so very much. Tell us what become of the slave. Huh? Tell us what become of the slave. Uh, he uh, he had uh, he married a uh, slave from the Martin family, and when uh, he came back, or Jake came back, and the war was over, <coughs> Jake told him said. It would be well if you leave because there's going to be a lot of turmoil. So he went up into Illinois and uh, <coughs> set up. Uh, Jake gave him the uh, uh, all of the tools out of the shop, and he was an excellent blacksmith. And the uh, stories that came back, they had two children, and uh, he did well in his shop and, and uh, had a good life afterwards. Well, good. That's great. Do what? What was Wyatt's major name? What was Lida's maiden name? Riley. Riley. Uh huh. And uh, her lineage goes back to 1680 in uh, Virginia. Uh, she uh, have uh, records of, of them from uh, 1680 something in uh, Virginia, and then they went into Carolinas and then on to Tennessee. But they had been here for a long, long time. The old Riggs home you spoke about. The what? The old Riggs home. Yeah. Was his aunt and uncle's. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And one of the boys still lives there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was uh, that was Tom's home, and uh, he had uh, three or four children. Uh, I know one of them. <coughs> uh, uh, Let's see, Simon Peter, <laughs> and uh, he was a member of the Methodist Church of Pocahontas, Simon Peter was. Jake, uh, are there very many, I'm not picking sides, but are there very many male fosters left in the county? No. Uh, there's a few of Tom's vintage, none of mine. Uh, I have uh, Steve.
Steve Foster, who's Boy Scout man, he's uh, in that uh, that group, and uh, um, James Foster is uh, in that lineage, and there's about three or four others, uh, but um, none of my uh, my dad only had one child, and his brother had three, and they all settled in uh, Florida. And, uh, and the Fosters that live there in that community today, they're Tom's descendants? Do what? The Fosters that still live there in the Foster community? Yeah, they're, they're, they're Tom's descendants? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, those are all our Tom's, Tom's people. Um, they're where the Carrolls have most of uh, my grandfather's place and Uncle Darb's old place. Yeah. I don't know if you all read about Darb's hole uh, and uh, the fishing hole, but uh, uh, that was right there uh, when you uh, cross the river. And, uh, <coughs> ours seem to move on to Missouri and different places. Um, I don't let's see. Well, none of the none of Foster because uh, someone went to California. <coughs> Jake Foster went to California. Uh, he had. Uh, quite a family. But there was a Jake Foster here for ever, you know. Uh, Counting you. What? Counting you. There were lots of Jake Fosters. Yeah. Here. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was Jake wounded at the Battle of Corinth, Mississippi? Yeah, Corinth, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, uh, and see, then they went on and <clears throat> Oh, uh, went on to Georgia and fought against uh, Sherman, and that's where uh, Rufus H. Black lost his arm. Uh, was it uh, Rakitak, Georgia? Uh, I believe it was Rakitak, yeah. And he lost his arm there, and uh, that, that yes, Bill. We tried to uh, locate Foster Ford. Is that upriver from the bridge now? Yes. That's, that's what we figured. Uh, now, my dad or my grandfather said that it, the river has changed that fort. But uh, James Carroll probably has got the best idea of where it is. Uh, but my grandfather said the river cut a swipe in there and took out the old foster ford. Right. Uh, but that is supposedly where the trail of tears came across. And uh, for a long time before there was a bridge there, it was quite a a passage back and forth there. <coughs> on the Forshee? You're talking about on the Forshee? Yes. Forshee River, yes. Forshee Divide. Jake, that Riggs house has some legal history, doesn't it? I mean, was yeah. it court? Can you tell us about that? And was your family um, it was hosting the, it or what? It was the uh, first, the first court was held there. The first court in Rand Randolph County yeah. after we became Randolph County? Yeah. And Tom made the first entry, the first page, the first uh, in Randolph County on recording a, 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 the... Uh, court records? Huh? Court records? Uh, really? Yeah, the first book, the first page, well, it was the first entry. First page of the first book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the first line. I talked to Mr. Riggs about that quite a bit, and he told me when he bought Bill Raper's house, remember where Bill Raper's house is, that brick house on north of Riggs' house? 
that he was going to move up there and they was going to strip the siding off of that house and put it back like it originally was. He never got it done and I've asked him several times over the years. Well, he said I'm waiting on an architect. I don't know. I guess he's still waiting on an architect, but I was excited about him doing that. That was long before they started the upsell in Looney House that he told me they were going to do that. I would have loved to have bought that place, uh, I tell you. Uh, I've spent a lot of time there. Uh, we would uh, we would walk up there, my grandmother and I, uh, and visit when uh, Simon Peter lived there. And, uh, uh, now Simon Peter was Riggs? Was what? Simon Peter was Riggs? Or who was, Robinson? Who was Simon Peter? Foster. <coughs> he, he was uh, okay. one of Tom's boys. Oh, okay. Tom left that. See, Tom uh, bought that from his uh, uh, father in law. And uh, let's see, their name was. Uh, I got it here. Now, how did the rigs come in? Were they relation to, or no, they just bought it? No, they just evidently bought it uh, when, uh, uh, I don't know if Jim or Simon Peter wound up with that, uh, rig, uh, to sell it, but uh, Simon Peter had two boys, and they uh, were, went over to Walnut Ridge, and they were in the furniture business over there for years. Uh, back when I was, I was young. And, uh, you probably know that, but uh, that corn crib, the barn, that's at just north of the house, was built in 1934. And when uh, Mr. Riggs uh, uh, lives there now, we had that all redone and added on to it and put the whole lot different. There was one sill next to it, it's kind of sloped down, and the one that was on the high side was rotten. All the rest of them were perfect under there and they had to, re they had to replace them or the floor. Yeah. I played a lot of times in the loft of that thing. <laughs> uh, uh, it, uh, you talking about the Jarrett, Mr. Jarrett being shot by his son-in-law because that rock still stands there that his son-in-law hid behind and the reason his son-in-law was never arrested, he immediately left and they thought he went to Texas but nobody ever knew he just disappeared. Yeah. But it was over the way they divided the, the land. The right, family. it was a land land dispute. He was upset about what his wife got right. out of it. Right. And Charles Garrett still has the pistol that his grandfather was wearing when he got shot. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> he also has the bridle from the horse. Uh, uh, that was that was quite a story, uh, and uh, I have been told uh, that uh, Jake kind of helped him get away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he could get his. I, I don't, you know, as I say, half truth, half fiction, and half lies. So, uh, I, uh, I grew up in uh, western Oklahoma where the land run was. I thought Oklahoma had more history than any place in the world. I come here where there wasn't any history. And I found out that there's more history here than anywhere there I've ever lived. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, the history here. Well, uh, there was another lady that uh, I would have liked to talk about, and that was my grandmother. Uh, now, you talk about uh, a rough riding dude. Now she was, I don't understand how this woman did what she did, but she was a school teacher, she was a midwife. 
one of the best horse women you ever saw in your life. She rode on side saddle, and she could jump any rail fence in Randolph County. <laughs> and we'd be there at the house, and the door, hear a knock at the door, and a few minutes, I'd hear my grandmother say, George, saddle my horse. Well, she had a big uh, block out, right outside the uh, yard there, where she mounted. And she had a denim, a denim skirt that went all the way to her ankles, sewed up in the middle. And she'd get on that horse and you'd hear them take off across the, hitting those old rock blades at full speed. And the next morning you'd hear her come back and walk. <laughs> and she'd been up all night delivering a baby somewhere. And, uh, Dr. Ryburn taught her how to, her, and she got her certificate from Doc Ryburn on being a midwife. What was her name, Jane? Uh, what was her name? Ethel, Ethel Foster. Ethel Foster. What was her main name? Uh, Myrick. And her grandmother, there's another story I wrote about, wrote, and some of the people have written, uh, have read here that I wrote about her grandmother that came out of Georgia. And uh, she, uh, was in the uh, March to the Sea by Sherman, and he burned their place, and her husband was killed in the war, and uh, uh, she, uh, they were getting ready to burn her place, and uh, this young lieutenant had a and she recognized as a master mason and she gave him the sign of a widow in distress, a master mason's widow in distress and he got off his horse and said what, what do I need to know about your situation and she said young man said you've run off all my slaves, you've taken my horses, you take all my cows, you've taken everything, you pile all my stuff out here to burn, I'm getting ready to burn my house, and you ask me what my situation is? <laughs> and he said, well, I, uh, she said, now, I know your obligations, and said, my husband was a master mason, and I know your obligations. He said, yes. And so she uh, told him that, that uh, he asked her, said, have you got any people uh, left? And she said, yes, I've got two brothers in uh, Conway, Arkansas. So he told the sergeant, said, sergeant, there's a two-wheel cart. And said, you go down to the barn, get that two-wheel cart a team of horses and you bring it back up here and you let her load everything that she can get on that and she also said that you run off all my slaves except these two that were given to me when I was married and said this one she's raised me since I was a baby so he told the two uh, slaves said now you stay with her till you get her to Arkansas and then you're free well, uh, they loaded everything up, and, and uh, so when the sergeant started down there, she said, <coughs> she had two children, she said, would you have him bring me a cow? I said, I want milk for my, on my way for my kids, and they, he said, yeah, bring her a cow. And she said, also, said my 
saddle that's down there. Uh, Dad bought me when I was a little girl. And they gave her that side saddle, and that's the one my grandmother rode. Uh, and uh, so I uh, started them to Arkansas, and uh, she had uh, two or three stories before she got here, but uh, she got to, got to Arkansas. Quite a quite a story. And while they were doing that, Sherman rode up, and uh, the sergeant had been arguing with this lieutenant about doing all this because Sherman's orders was you burn everything to the sea, and of course that was right after uh, the sacking of, of Atlanta. And if any of you have ever been in uh, underground in Atlanta and saw what devastation that was. That was awful. But anyhow, uh, he rode up and uh, the sergeant was arguing with this lieutenant and, and the major asked said, what's the problem here? And, and uh, the lieutenant uh, told him, he said, this, is a, this lady is the widow of a master mason. He said, I'm a master mason. He said, General, I know you're a Mason, too. And he said, yes. And he told him what he was doing. And uh, he told us, Lieutenant, says, Lieutenant, I'm proud of you. He said, you've learned two lessons today. He said, one of them you've learned that uh, in command, there's always decisions that are not in the books. And he said, I'm proud of you because you made the right decision to see that this lady gets to Arkansas. And I don't know, I'm not preaching about Masonic, but any of you who are Masons know what, what your obligations are, and uh, we try to live by them. And uh, that, that's a carryover from many, many years. That's how she got to Arkansas, my grandmother. She, she didn't go all the way to Conway, though, did she? Huh? She didn't go all the way to Conway? Did she go to Conway? Yes, she, you know, she got to Conway, and finally her daughter and uh, married, and uh, married, uh, and they, they moved on with her up here. And she's buried at... Um, Sparks? Huh? Spikes? No, up, uh, up uh, uh, where the ferry was. Pittman. Pittman Ferry. Yeah, she, uh -huh. yeah, she buried at Pittman Cemetery up there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, How long did it take her to get to Conway? Well, she married in between. Maybe had a bigger way. Well, that was another story. She got to uh, uh, Birmingham, and uh, one of her schoolmates, evidently her dad had been uh, pretty well off, and she had lived a good life in the, and had been a plantation girl, and had gone away to school, and she had this friend that lived there, and moved uh, while she was, she stopped and was going to take some time there. And so while she was there, uh, her uh, friend introduced her to this young fellow, and uh, they got married. Well, come to find out, he was a bushwhacker. And so when she found out about it, and the first time he took off, he loaded, she loaded his wagon <laughs> and, and her team, and uh, she had, uh, when they were burning her house, she had gone back, and her husband had left her 20, 20 dollar gold pieces 
and had, she put those in a sack and kept it in the warming uh, of the old stove. And before she left, while they were sacking her house, she uh, went in and found those and put those in her sewing basket. And the story goes that uh, as they rode off, uh, the slaves uh, with the horse and uh, buggy, or Car, she's sitting up on top with her sewing <laughs> face and, and one of the, the children in her lap. And uh, she got to Arkansas with uh, those $20 gold pieces. And of course, during the war, gold was at a premium because, you know, paper money was floating pretty rampant. So she was able to buy a pretty nice place with, with the gold she had saved. And, uh, time marches on and people. Well, we have, uh, Jake, we've got refreshments over here that, that everybody might enjoy. And I'm sure uh, there's some people here who might want to visit with you for a few minutes. <laughs> So thank you all so much for coming, and uh, feel free to stick around a while and look around the museum if you'd like, and remember next week, Monday night. It's going to be a little bit different, but it'll be real good. James, if you can make